Welcome everybody to tonight's proceedings, uh, some here in person at the Royal Society of Victoria's Ellery Theatre uh, in Melbourne, Australia, because we have some international guests online. There are some people joining us via Zoom uh, on a, as a webinar and others online live streamed via YouTube. So uh, welcome to you all. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that all of us here in Australia are located on the traditional lands of this continent's first scientists the many different First Nations peoples who belong to the diverse lands and waters of this remarkable region of our amazing planet. Here at the Royal Society, we're on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Woiwurrung language group, and I invite everyone joining us tonight, uh, either via Zoom webinars chat function or via YouTube's comments section for those following on the live stream, uh, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of your own local country and join me in paying respects to elders past and present. And likewise, we extend our respects to any uh, Indigenous Australians who are joining us for our meeting tonight. Um, a very warm welcome to everyone, and in particular uh, to our colleagues from the ARC Training Centre for Green Chemistry and Manufacturing joining us, uh, both here in the theatre in Melbourne and online, and also the delegates to the 15th Green Chemistry Postgraduate Summer School who are tuning in from Venezia in Italia. Uh, about 40 of them, so welcome to you online as well. Uh, they're joining us with the support of the Green Sciences for Sustainable Development Foundation. Tonight we're delighted to be joined by Drs John Warner and Paul Anastas for their uh, presentation titled Reinventing the Chemical Industry with Green Chemistry. Uh, there's a couple of little play on words that I tried to do, but I don't know if it works. Uh, let me uh, talk, tell you a little bit about our distinguished guests. Um, I'll start with Paul. Uh, Professor Paul T. Anastas is an American scientist, inventor, author, entrepreneur, professor and public servant. He holds the highest chair in chemistry for the environment at Yale University and has served in four US presidential administrations. Dr. Anastas has co-founded four manufacturing companies and has published 14 books on sustainability and green chemistry. As the founding director of the Centre for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering since 2007, he's published over 200 research papers on green synthetic methodologies, earth abundant catalyst development, green hydrogen, carbon utilisation, molecular des design for reduced hazard and the integrated biorefinery. His most recent book, First Do No Harm, A Chemist's Guide to Molecular Design for Reduced Hazard, was published in May this year. Welcome to you, Paul. Uh, now to John, Dr. John Warner is one of the founders of the field of green chemistry. He wrote the book that provides the definition and 12 principles of green chemistry with Paul Anastas back in 1998. That's some time ago now. As an industrial chemist, he has over 340 patents and has worked with hundreds of companies worldwide. He received the Perkin Medal in 2014 from the Society of Industrial Chemistry. As an academic, he was full professor of chemistry and full professor of plastics engineering at the University of Massachusetts, where he started the world's first PhD program in green chemistry. Is over 120 papers in non-covalent derivatization, polymer photochemistry, metal oxide semiconductors, and green chemistry. Uh, last year, he received the August Wilhelm van Hoffmann Medal from the German Chemical Society, and in 2004, the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Mentoring from the US National Science Foundation and President George W. Bush. As an inventor, John's inventions have led to the founding of many companies in the fields of photovoltaics, neurochemistry, construction materials, and cosmetics. In 2016, he received the Lemelson, Inv Lemelson Invention Ambassadorship from the Lemelson Foundation and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. John's a member of the Club of Rome. He's Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at Monash University here in Australia, Distinguished Professor of Chemistry at the, I'm going to guess, John, the Chula Longhorn University in Thailand, an honorary professor of chemistry at the Technical University of Berlin, where they have named the John Warner Center for Startups in Green Chemistry. Congratulations on that. Welcome, John. Would you both like to come up and just uh, introduce, we'll have a couple of few words with you. Um, my first question, I guess, before I let you do your presentation, where does green chemistry sit in that big world of chemistry nowadays? Is it still little and growing, or is it really making a mark? What's the, what's the status of green chemistry in the, in, 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 in the broad spectrum? 
It's infiltrating its way into all of the chemical enterprises in one way or another, some places large and some places small. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, uh, I would echo what John says, that if we were to try to list off all of the different countries, networks, companies, research groups, we, we could go on all night. But the good thing about this is, that represents still a fraction of the power and the potential of green chemistry. Okay, so long way to go yes. is the message. All yes. right, Who's, who, who begins? John begins? I guess I go. will. Yeah. Okay. We're okay. really looking forward to what you have to say. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here in this amazing building and this amazing society. And obviously, neither Paul or I would be here without the work of Monash University and Professor Patti here, uh, who you know is the first university in the Southern Hemisphere to sign what's called the Green Chemistry Commitment. And so, uh, both I speak for Paul and myself that we're honored to be able to support and, and, and help um, what's growing and becoming even more important here in Australia. Um, I want to I wanna just quickly again, uh, so as to give you a good framing, I've, I've kind of been blessed to look at all the aspects and be inside all the aspects of the chemical enterprises. I uh, started you know, life as an industrial chemist at the Polaroid Corporation, uh, getting into materials and polymers and manufacturing processes. Then I did an academic stint for about 13 years in chemistry and plastics engineering. And then I was blessed to have the opportunity create my own research institute called the Warner Babcock Institute for Green Chemistry. And over COVID, I did a little bit of a professional sabbatical with this company called Zymogen to learn about fermentation in the synthetic biology world. Um, over this time, I've worked with many, many companies. The, these companies here in is in the public domain patents that I have issued and worked with them. Then's named this many other companies that haven't gone public yet that I can't I can't describe. And have been blessed to start a bunch of different companies uh, to show the power of green chemistry, the way to accelerate uh, a concept into the marketplace. You know, Paul and I have been at this for a very long time. I think the first, you know 1991-ish time frame. Uh, the book came out 25 years ago. Um, we, the, the world's first PhD program in green chemistry was in 2001. Beyond Benign, the nonprofit education organization in 2007. And the, what we call the Green Chemistry Commitments 10th anniversary. And just to show how long we've been at it, these young, young people here have been, been, been you know, shoulder to shoulder for a very long time now. But, but, but here we are. You know, and there's so many approaches to sustainability we hear about. Responsible care, safe and sustainable by design, resilient systems, thinking, limits to growth, the UN SDGs, circular economy, biomimicry, ecology of commerce, greater the cradle, planetary boundaries and green chemistry. It's almost like there's so many different approaches. What makes me so sad right now, we're in such a polarized society. Every time someone says, oh, this is the right approach and this is the incorrect approach, or this one's better and this one's not, you know, the world is facing so many diverse problems, and we humans are such a diverse group of people. If someone wakes up in the morning and one of these approaches speaks to them, rather than explain to them why they should be doing something else, we should just kind of find a way to work better together and mutually support one another. And what that requires is us to take a step back and look at the materials economy and the materials ecology through a, through, a, through a different lens. And so the way I like to describe it, we take natural resources and through extraction we make molecules and ingredients. Then we take those molecules and ingredients and we synthesize materials and components. Then we take those materials and components and we manufacture products. And if we do a very good job, those products stay in use and reuse for a very long time. But inevitably, we have to turn those products back to materials and components through mechanical recycling, through what I call the assembly-disassembly system. Then we have to take those materials and components and revert them back to molecules and ingredients through reprocessing, what I call the materials metabolism. And then finally, we want those molecules and ingredients to degrade back to natural resources of the regeneration cycle so that we can ultimately maintain stable ecosystems. This isn't a circle, and although the, the word isn't quite accurate, I refer to this as a pendulum. 
All right, and what it is is if you look at the intersection down the bottom, going clockwise in this pendulum is the human-built world, and going clockwise in this pendulum is the natural world. And if we look at that intersection on the bottom, it is an algorithmical assessment of sustainability. We can look at how we in the human-built world are impacting the natural world and if that overlap is appropriate or not. So it would be foolhardy to be get to believe that there's no impact, but as long as being mindful of what that impact is. But sometimes we, we get caught up in separating the human built world from the natural world. We humans are organisms that are a, are a result of evolution. We are as much a part of nature as anything else. And I think sometimes that puts us in the wrong place when we start to think of ourselves as being outside of nature. So let's look at these five systems through the lens of nature versus humans, okay? So the first one is use and reuse. Okay? Think about something like a, a termite mound. Termite mound networks can be seen from satellites in space. These termites manufacture a concrete from their saliva using pebbles and rocks that make a construction material. That termite mound will last over a century after the termites are long gone. And so here, a natural species creating an adorable good that lasts for a very long time after they're done using it. Okay, then there are things like hornet's nests and bees' nests that are somewhat durable but a little bit less. And then there are things like this, this hermit crab. The hermit crab, he, he, he goes into that shell. He didn't make the shell. He didn't manufacture it. He uses it until it gets too big. And then when he gets bigger, he leaves that, finds another one. And then when he gets bigger, he finds another one. And so the hermit crab isn't making the, that shell, but is using it over and over again. Now, we in the human-built world, we have durable pots that last for a very long time, like automobile pots or playground pots. Or we have some things that are cups, you know, that, you know, that we want to use over and over again, use and reuse. Now, the hallmark of the station, if we put on the lens of thermodynamics and take a step back, is that we, have, we want to maintain the structural form of these products, and we want to maintain the chemistry. And so long as we can maintain the form and the chemistry, we can stay in that use and reuse circle forever. But that would violate the fundamental rules of thermodynamics. There is this thing called entropy. And inevitably, something's going to happen. When that happens, we go counterclockwise on the pendulum to the next system, the assemble and disassemble system. In nature, there are many species of birds and other animals that will pick up stuff from the ground, twigs and leaves and branches, and build a nest. And then they will have the eggs, the chicks will go off. Now, interestingly enough, those birds may come back to rebuild the nest, but they won't use the same nest. They will disassemble it. They will toss it all out and then go back and maybe pick up those very same pieces. But they're the pre-programming to assemble and disassemble over and over again. Go from twigs on the ground, branches on the ground to a nest and back and forth. Now, we humans do the same thing in many areas. Plastics go into any emergency room in a hospital. Look at all the plastic parts that are in there. What do we do? We take those plastic parts and we break them down into pellets. Then we re-injection mold and we make new pots, then we break them down and we make them into pellets. And the same thing in the paper industry, we may have sheets of paper that we grind up in pulp and then we'll take that pulped paper and remake sheets. So again, assembling and disassembling. Here, the hallmark of this station is that we're allowing the structure to change. We are in fact changing the structure while maintaining the chemistry. So as long as we can maintain the chemistry and allow the structure to change, we can stay in that loop forever and ever. But again, it would violate the fundamental laws of thermodynamics and this thing called entropy that comes up. And every time you mechanically recycle a fiber or a polymer, there is a good chance you're going to break it into pieces. And at some point, you get into such tiny pieces that you've lost the mechanical properties, at which point we have to go to the next station in the pendulum. What I am favorite, my favorite pen part is the apex of this pendulum, the materials metabolism. Okay, now the materials metabolism is real, really kind of interesting. Because, you know, 
I'm going to use as an example one of the banes of my existence. In my house, we have these three things. Okay, these things offer no value to society. They consume food, leave hair everywhere, but somehow make my wife and daughter very happy. And so, but I, I don't know. Well, well, anyways, these things, what do they do when they eat food? When, when an animal, an organism like us eats food, what do we do? We take large molecules and so catabolism, we turn them into small molecules, right? We take proteins and we make amino acids. We take carbohydrates and make sugars. Take fats and we make fatty acids. But that's not all. Think about when you ate lunch today. You're sitting and you're eating your lunch, okay, and you're breaking big molecules into small molecules, but at the same time, you're also doing anabolism, creating those big molecules back again. So at the very moment that you're eating, you're growing hair, you're growing fingernails, you're growing blood cells. So nature and biology have combined the assembly and the disassembly of molecules in the same time, at the same place. We humans can't even think of anything in the human-built world that approaches that, but that's not all. Also, what's happening is energy, right? Food is fuel. We're not only making materials, we're making energy. And so nature has not only um, looking at the disassembly and assembly at the molecular level, but also harnessing the energy. Most things in biology are coupled with the magic molecule adenosine triphosphate. Those five negative charges of you know, negative charges tend to repulse each other. And so there's a whole lot of potential energy there. So what happens is as in biology, we consume food that gives off energy exothermically, somewhere there is a coupled reaction that pushes those phosphate groups together. And that's charging our molecular battery. And then when we require that energy, we pop those phosphate groups off and that releases energy. And so the molecular batteries within organisms is coupled with the molecularity of transformations. And that's what makes this all work, is that nature has co-evolved not only the assembly and disassembly, but coupling the energy. Can you imagine a factory that you don't plug in because it's consuming the energy and that imagine a warehouse that you send out products and then you take back those products, and instead of storing them, as you bring those products back in, they get remanufactured. That is the standard approach of biology. And we humans have not come close to this, and what's really cool is that now there's no, there's no holes barred, right? The structure changes, the chemistry changes, so this is the bastion of future innovation and creativity. If you ask me, where do we have to go in the chemical sciences? We have to take a bit of humility, and instead of saying, wow, our 150 years of chemistry textbooks are really awesome, she said, well, nature has written a textbook for 3.8 billion years. That's a pretty good R&D process. Maybe with a little bit of humility, we should be looking at nature and figuring out how nature does things. And oh my goodness, what can we do next? All right. And so now we're at the apex. Let's go down the, the natural world. We want to essentially have things degrade and things like that. And, you know, in nature, what do you, you got a beaver that is going to, you know, cut down a tree to make a dam or bees are going to extract pollen and things like that. Nature does this. Now, our human extractive things, mining, forestry, and petroleum, I don't feel that it is impossible for us to improve these things and become more sustainable. In fact, I feel we can do it with a little bit of humility and a little bit of learning from nature. We can change this, but right now we've got a long way to go to get these into a truly sustainable, natural uh, kind of rhythm. And then finally, close your eyes, go to your happy place. We all kind of know what we mean by the natural ecosystems. So here we are, we have the final thing, and as a member of the Club of Rome, we've really, you know, Donella Meadows back in the very early 1970s began the whole field of systems thinking. Sys thinking in systems has been around for 60 years, and the, it, what I feel is when someone draws a map of a system, we must be very conscious of the fact that any representation of a system must by definition have information loss. And so we have to be willing to realize that no one's smart enough to get this quite right. And there's always going to be things missing. So for example, when we do the assemble and disassemble, there is inevitably going to be leakage. And when that leakage happens, it creates a porosity in this interface. And we lose a little bit of sustainability.
When we do materials metabolism, there's going to be leakage. And there's more porosity in that interface with a loss of sustainability. When we do regeneration, there's going to be additional leakage and a little more loss of sustainability. So we've got to realize that not always is it just things happening the way we plan, but inevitably there's going to be things that we don't plan. So when people put out these maps and talk about their plans for 2030 sustainability goals, very rarely do they say, oh, and by the way, every once in a while we're going to have an oil spill or we'll have some plastics accumulate into the environment or a train derailment every once in a while or CO2 affecting the, the global climate. And so we need to realize that it's not just designing things hoping that everything works out right, but we have also a moral an ethical responsibility to design things for when they don't. And so essentially, when we, when we look at this here, what we say when the clockwise fashion, we want to invent technologies to help society adopt behavioral modifications. But that's not all. We also want to invent technologies that are intrinsically in harmony with nature. And so it's not one or the other. We really got to go hand in hand and figure out a way to do this as we go forward. And so that's a, that's a critical thing. And so here we are with the whole thing where I, like I said a couple times now, feel very excited and spend most of my research time is in this box here, because I would argue all the other processes we're doing, we've got to do a lot better, but we almost have nothing. All we have for the, at the best here is paralysis of petroleum products, and there is so much that nature lives by that we haven't touched yet. So that is essentially where green chemistry fits into every one of those circles, every one of those cycles is where green chemistry, is the utilization of a set of principles that reduce or eliminate the use of generation of hazardous substances and the design, manufacture, application of chemical uh, products. And so the whole point here that's not measuring, it's not remediating, it's not picking up, it's inventing the product to not have those problems in the first place. That's a singularly unique thing. And so the principles of green chemistry are not marketing bumper stickers. I don't expect people to say, hey, buy this product because it's consistent with four of the 12 principles. When I look at these principles, they speak to mechanistic chemistry. They speak to the person in the lab that he or she is pouring the beakers in the flask. We're talking about activation energy. We're talking about um, protecting groups. And it's deep, fundamental mechanistic chemistry. So one way to think about it is green chemistry is the molecular mechanisms of sustainability. Okay, and so uh, essentially, but here's the problem. Imagine if tomorrow morning, every person in the world wakes up and says, you know, I'm only gonna buy sustainable products. Every retailer says, we're only gonna sell sustainable products. Every manufacturer says, we're only gonna make sustainable products. Okay, job done. Well, we got a problem. I would argue of all the products and processes in our society today, maybe 10% truly tick all the boxes. 90% is either a big problem, little problem, but there's some things we got to do better. If we look at the low-hanging fruit, the things that are existing in the supply chain that might help us, maybe there's another 10, 15%. But right now in 2023, I would argue 65, 70, maybe even 75% of the technologies haven't been invented yet. This isn't an epic battle of good and evil. This isn't Darth Vader and industry and environmentalist Luke Skywalker fighting some epic age-old battle. Yes, there's a little bit of that going on, but there's a certain more fundamental crisis here that it's not a crisis of desire. It's a crisis of ability. Do we have a workforce that understands how to invent technologies? Right now, you can get a PhD in chemistry at almost every global university and never have a class on how do you predict whether something is toxic. You can get a license to go invent for the world and never have any idea about the environmental mechanisms of degradation. So how can we ask people who have absolutely no training in this to solve these problems. And that's the point of green chemistry. It is that mechanistic science that adds to all the amazing other things that people do. But of course, therefore, the biggest barrier to this game is actually the invention. All right, and so how do we do this? And so, again, 
I've been at this for a very long time. People say, oh, you know, John, we're in the real world. We have to worry about getting products to market. We don't have time for this green chemistry. Well, in the last 12 years, with about 20 people, filed over almost 350 patents, okay? And I want to give you some examples of what does green chemistry look like as a product. So one example. One day I was thinking about insects. When a bug starts to get bigger, its exoskeleton, they sh it sheds its exoskeleton, and for a moment it's very vulnerable to the ecosystem. So very quickly it has to turn hard and black. I said, ooh, there's something in, in nature that goes from white to black. People color their hair. I wonder. So I look up, and, and it turns out it's a terosinase oxidative cascade. Now, I don't want to grind up dead bugs. That sounds nasty. So instead, I, I, I found these beans called velvet bean that has the same kind of biochemistry. So I take this, I come up with a catalyst, I come up with this package of materials to do it, buy a bunch of gray hair, and boom, it actually worked. It doesn't fade, it doesn't wash, it's all edible ingredients. But what's really interesting, it's not painting the hair. It's not coloring the hair, it's restoring the human pigment. I'm the grayest person, so I go, okay, hit me. And my hair goes back to the color it was 30 years ago. My friend with black hair, it goes to black hair. Someone with brown hair, it goes brown. The same bottle actually re-triggers the natural process to fill in the color that your hair would have been had it not gone gray. In the same way that, that you have a fingerprint I realized we have a hair print, all right? And so this company, we founded this company back um, many years ago. And if you go online to myhairprint.com for $29.99, you can get this box. And if you act quickly, they'll throw in a knife. But um, it's, this is an example of green chemistry bringing a product to market. Another example, this, is, this stuff here is brick dust. It's called copper ATSM. Copper ATSM is one of these academic molecules that if you put in DMSO and a bunch of surfactants, and put it in laboratory animal that shows amazing neurological benefit. But you could never use these kinds of surfactants and solvents in, bio, in true medicine. So a green chemistry technology called non-covalent derivatization allowed us to increase the oral bioavailability, increase the blood-brain barrier penetration through a new technology called mechanochemistry, a solventless process of grinding reagents together to construct this. And what ended up happening, this work worked so well that we started a company called Collaborative Medicinal Development in partnership with the University of Melbourne. We very quickly went through phase one, phase two, phase three. We're in phase three clinical trials for what is one of the most promising ALS drugs going on. Still a long, long way to go, but um, this is really exciting and would not have been possible without applying the principles of green chemistry to the design of this thing. Next example I have is, is asphalt pavement. Okay, there are millions of miles of asphalt pavement in the world. The sun and the air oxidize the surface of the asphalt, making it brittle and hard. So we replace most of the asphalt. About 10% every year gets repaved. But what happens is that brittle stuff that we dig up, it's kind of useless. It's too hard. It's too brittle. So it either goes into a landfill. Maybe we use it as an understructure or something. I said, why can't we invent a catalyst that enables us to just recover that oxidized stuff? And so back in 2013, if I'm going to put stuff in my head, I'm going to dig up my own driveway. Dug up my own driveway, got a bunch of workers. It was a very cold day. I used all you know, recycled material, and it worked. It worked really, really well. It actually outperforms industry standard asphalt. So started a company called Collaborative Aggregates and created a product called Delta S and Delta Mist, and this has been on the market now. 37 states in the United States have approved it on government, government uh, paving jobs. So this is a use of the principles of green chemistry. My last example... I love Escher, N.C. Escher, and this, these graphics. You look at this thing here, there's the birds in the sky and the fish in the bottom, but it's an optical illusion. When do the birds stop being birds? When do the fish stop being fish? There's a lot of boundaries in nature that are fuzzy like this and not discrete. And so I realized that the electron transfer in a mitochondria matrix is very fuzzy with a bunch of little jumps. So I said, oh, I wonder if I could synthesize a semiconductor and make the semiconductor kind of optical illusion turn into a chromophore and have the chromophore kind of fuzzily turn into an electrolyte. Could I make a photovoltaic system? So I made a bunch of photovoltaic. It turns out it is the most efficient photovoltaic system 
kind of in history. And so very quickly started a company called Ambient Photonics and just recently, about six months ago, Amazon invested nearly $50 million and we're in manufacturing in California uh, for a, a low light. This isn't for outdoor use, for any fire detector, smoke detector, any indoor product that requires oftentimes changing a battery, this constantly charges the battery instead, so for all these indoor uses. So these are four examples of green chemistry in the real world, and there are many, many more examples. But the last thing I want to leave you with is the big thing that worries me right now and keeps me awake at night is we still got a long way to go. And most universities still aren't teaching how do you anticipate negative impacts on human health and the environment when you invent stuff? The definition of green chemistry. And so Dr. Amy Can and my wife and I back in 2007 started a nonprofit university organization and we asked chemistry departments at universities to sign a commitment that they will bring the principles of green chemistry into the required curriculum, not as an elective, but to change the fundamental concept of what it means to be a chemist, to be a material scientist. I'm proud to say that over 120 universities worldwide have signed this commitment. And again, Monash is the first university in the Southern Hemisphere to do this. This is where change is going to happen. It's not going to happen by wishing and dreaming and hoping. We need people who have the fundamental skills. We need to teach those fundamental skills. And I'm super optimistic because it is happening. We've spent time here in Australia and Cairns and Brisbane and, and Melbourne, the next generation refuses to do it any other way. We just got to put together the willpower to give them the tools and just watch amazing happen. Thank you. President Jell. Royal Society of Victoria, Tony Patty, Monash, thank you for the opportunity to speak. When I, whenever I think about how long I should speak, I remember Socrates. He could go on and on and wax philosophic for hours and days, and they killed him. So I'm going to be brief. I'll keep it brief. But I will, I will note that um, one of the things that uh, we need to recognize is that the old saying is that if you do what you always do, you're going to get what you always got. So we're facing a whole lot of uh, challenges in a world where, <clears throat> in a world where uh, everything that we see, touch, and feel is a chemical. Everything is, is matter or energy. And what green chemistry is about is how you use, um, use these principles to redesign the material basis of our society and our economy in ways that even touch the materials that are used to generate, store, and transport our energy. As Einstein famously said, what did Einstein famously <laughs> say? Oh, I remember what he said. Einstein famously said problems can't be solved at the same level of awareness that created them. And so if we're going to take on these great grand challenges, it's unlikely that we're going to just tweak around the edges and make things a little bit less bad. We have to take on these challenges with a new perspective. Looking at the same things from a different angle with a new perspective can reveal many uh, different approaches. You might say that this is a pile of trash, but if you shine a light from a particular uh, vantage point, you're going to see that it's actually a couple enjoying the evening together. If you look at this pile of toys and uh, shine a light from a particular perspective, you're going to see that it's a child looking at an evening star. If you look at this stack of coins from a particular perspective, you'll see that it's Atlas holding up the world. And it's not always just one simple perspective. You can look at the same situation from many perspectives. So this is wonderful art. But what does this have to do with the challenges that we face? The challenges that we face are uh, complex, often egregious. When we look at abject poverty and despair, if you look at it from a different perspective, as was done, let's call it 10 or 15 years ago or more, it can be looked at as a trade advantage due to low labor costs, which 
raised well over a billion people out of abject poverty. You can look at this as industrialized state of development, transportation, rail, roads, energy, shipping, or from a different perspective, it can be viewed as entrenched decaying infrastructure that actually impairs the ability to embrace innovation because of the invested pipe in the ground and stranded assets. You can look at this in the old ways and uh, quite tragically, in some cases, insulting ways of disabilities or handicap, or thanks to the work of Hugh Herr at MIT, it can look, be looked upon as a competitive advantage. And everything from ballroom dancing, to sprinting, to rock climbing. So what does this mean when we say we look at the same problems differently and transform our problems into potential opportunities? Well, one of the old ways that we've gone about things is captured in this paper from um, 1972, so 51 years ago, by P.W. Anderson, the great physicist, who talked, uh, and more is different, talked about the reductionist hypothesis. And he says this important first sentence, the reductionist hypothesis may still be a topic of controversy among philosophers, but among the great majority of active scientists, I think it is accepted without question. 51 years later, I would agree with that. We all know that over the past 200 years, reductionism, holding all parameters constant, changing one and observing so that we get an understanding of the universe, is, has been tremendously powerful, has allowed us to understand the world and how it works and create really modern life. But the most important sentence in this paper was this one. It says, the main fallacy in this kind of thinking is that the reductionist hypothesis does not by any means imply a constructionist one. The ability to reduce everything to simple uh, fundamental laws does not imply the ability to start from those laws and reconstruct the universe. So what does that mean? It means that our ways of understanding, of analyzing, of breaking apart our complex problems in order to create a model of reality is not reality itself. And what that results in, tragically, is unintended consequences. Because while we can have so many wonderful inventions, accomplishments, breakthroughs, and everything from, from energy to medicine to, to materials, et cetera, et cetera, it's that construct that is contributing, contributing, not alone, but contributing to many of our unintended consequences and sustainability challenges. So we have been miraculously good at solving problems. No doubt about it, as a species, the past 200 years or so, we have taken on some, some amazing problems and come up with tremendous, tremendously innovative solutions. There's only one problem with this. We're terribly bad at defining problems well. Getting the problem statement right has been a, uh, been a difficulty for us. So we don't want to just generate cheap energy. We want to generate energy that doesn't change the only atmosphere and climate that we have. We don't want to generate um, medicines that, um, that extend life and improve quality of life. We want to do it in ways that don't actually disperse carcinogens and other poisons into our environment. We don't want to grow more crops. We want to grow crops in ways that aren't going to make our waters and our soils toxic. I could go on and on. So we haven't fully developed our problem statement capabilities. One example, my favorite example, is that of efficiency. Now, I'm going to ask you how many people know that we've all been taught that efficiency is a good thing. If, could you raise your hands if you think efficiency is a good thing? Wonderful. Yes, efficiency is indeed what we've been taught is a good thing. And I'm here to tell you that efficiency has no value, it has no desirability, and it has no nobility. Oh my goodness. People are not happy with me right now. <laughs> All right. So you want me to prove it to you. Right. Okay, that's fair. That is fair. Okay. So would you want a very efficient criminal, a very efficient robber? Anybody? No. Nope. 
Nobody, okay. Would you want a very efficient virus? I know the answer to that one. Nobody wants a very efficient virus, very efficient carcinogen, very efficient poison. Well, of course not. Of course not. So what's the point? The point is that value, the desirability, the nobility of something doesn't come from whether or not it's efficient. It comes from the action itself. The desirability of an action comes from the action itself and no amount of efficiency is going to change it from undesirable to desirable. So why is this seemingly trivial important, uh, point so important? Well, it's because we've been spending the last, let's call it 50 or 60 years, trying to make fundamentally and inherently unsustainable products, processes, and systems more efficient. Whether it's petrochemical refineries, whether it's um, uh, diesel engines, whether it's uh, urea formaldehyde, um, uh, foam insulations, you name it, whatever it is. These things are not going to transform something bad into something good, something unsustainable into something sustainable. It might preserve them in the marketplace. It might make them more legally and socially acceptable, but it's not going to change their inherent nature. In other words, efficiency will help you do the thing that you're doing better but it is not going to help you do a better thing. So we have this great grand challenge. Whether you want to talk about climate change, whether you want to talk about resource depletion, whether you want to talk about biodiversity loss, we could go on and on. We're talking about a civilization level wide challenge, transformation, but the good news is that this, this civilization level transformation has happened before in history. Whether it's the emergence of civilization and agriculture in, in Mesopotamia, whether it's the religious reformation throughout Europe, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, we could go on and on. This is where the, the, uh, where the organization, the structures of society uh, actually uh, transform. And when they transform, what accompanies this, this these shifts, these great transformations, is a shift in thinking about certainly at least three fundamental questions. What is knowable and unknowable? What is possible versus impossible? And what is our role in the universe vis-a-vis -vis a, a divine being or the universe itself? I'm going to suggest that there are, even looking only at technology forces in play, that there are forces that have the ability to change the answers to these questions. And I'm going to start with um, big data analytics, big data synthetics. You know, it was only, um, I, I suppose, about what, six years ago or so that for the first time in history, as I understand it, not being a data scientist, that we hit the first zettabyte of data almost an inconceivable amount of data. Exobytes are so trivial, you know, that's so yesterday. And at the time, Cisco Systems, the, the, the giant conglomerate Cisco Systems said, you know, it might have taken us over 40 years to hit the first zettabyte, but we're predicting it's not gonna take another 40 years to get to two. We're going to get to two in about four years. Do you know how many zettabytes were produced last year? as I understand it, 93. So this explosion and how we understand the, 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 the meaning of data, the flows of data in order to get um, understanding and, and make it useful is something that is um, changing the way that it informs um, what we know versus what we can't know. I'm also going to, to mention that this ability for us to have ubiquitous networked integrated sensors to the point where sensors are small, so small they're referred to as you know basically sensor dust they're so small so cheap fractions of a penny ubiquitous and interconnected right now i could probably look on my phone and uh, and if there were a marathon being uh, being run in Africa, I could tell you the heart rate of the winner in, in, in seconds, or I could tell you the average heart rate of all the winners. It, 
Again, it informs what's possible and impossible, knowable versus unknowable. 3D printing is no longer about little trinkets and gadgets and missing chess pieces and missing buttons. Now it's about a functioning, printing a functioning heart, a functioning lung. If that's not big enough for you, you can build entire houses and buildings from 3D printing. It changes what we think is possible and impossible. And of course, synthetic biology. If we walk down the street of Melbourne and we ask people, is it possible to generate new forms of life? The vast majority of people, I think, still today will say no. I said, well, have we formed new, new life forms? I'll say no. But of course we have. Craig Venner and the Venner Institute has done this over a decade ago. And there's many different, uh, with a minimal vi uh, viable uh, genome. Uh, and of course, even, I guess about two weeks ago now, we have a proto-embryo, not from starting from a sperm and an egg, but rather from a stem cell. So this idea of what's possible and uh, impossible, and yes, our role in the universe, of course, we have to mention generative artificial intelligence, which I won't talk too much about because it's all anybody's talking about these days. So, so when we start, I'm just going to suggest that any one of these trends, any one of these trends could change the way that we answer those questions, those three questions. And in combination, I would guess that none of us would venture how it can change the way that we answer those questions in synergy. So in other words, great transformations come when we have a new perspective and that new level of awareness that Albert Einstein talked about. So what does this enable? As we take on the sustainability challenges, as we say we have to design with a new perspective, rethink the way we, uh, we create the material basis of, of our civilization. Well, part of this is thinking in terms of systems. When I say, when I was talking about reductionism, no one in their right mind, I don't think, would throw out the power of reductionism but it does need to be coupled with reductive, integrative systems thinking. In other words, the kind of thinking that we do in our daily lives. We can't put aside the, 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 the brilliance of, as John said, 3.8 billion years or however long we've been walking upright. Um, we have to couple our, this soft, fuzzy intuition stuff and systems thinking approaches with our reductionism and everything from, yes, our design, understanding ethnography, understanding uh, uh, ecosystems in order to uh, not have the unintended consequences because our reductionist model is only a model until we understand that everything is inter interconnected to everything else. I do believe that photons and electrons are the future rather than our reliance on chlorine, phosgene, uh, cyanide. So there's reasons why when you look out at nature, there aren't giant clouds of chlorine and phosgene. There aren't giant lakes of cyanide and solutions. It's because nature imparts reactivity and transformation at the time and the place that it wants it, starting from very unreactive and non-toxic starting materials. It does it far more elegantly and in a scale that we can only imagine. We know that we need to move from our static, durable, uh, long-lasting uh, goals that we put on our materials and our molecules into things that are dynamic, adaptable, changeable systems. Somebody asks you, what color is your car? You say, what color would you like it to be? If you're going to use a solvent, you say, is it polar, is it nonpolar? What do you need it to be? Same with catalysts, same with our, all of our materials. Things that are responsive things that are dynamic, things that are obedient upon command. And this, of course, extends to how we design for deg degradation and disassembly. We can talk about a circular economy where, as John outlined, we want to make sure that these things go together uh, and come apart when we want them, but we're only going to be able to do that if we design them to do that. Designing for disassembly, self-healing, circularity is not part of our traditional framework, but it must be part of the future. Certainly our feedstocks 
need to go from finite and depleting to renewable and restorative. They have to be plentiful, and yes, we have to consider waste as part of our feedstock. Everybody knows that there is no waste in nature. Anytime a waste is generated, an organism evolves to use it as a food. That is the model that we need to go, go through. Now, I want to tell you one quick story, very quick story, and that is that any professor's best days is when a student walks through their, um, through their door, is particularly sharp and brilliant and creative and energetic, and says, I'd love to work for you. <laughs> that happened to me with Patrick Foley. Dr. Patrick Foley uh, and I worked together on uh, a number of new biomaterials, bioingredients, breaking down lignin into, uh, uh, into, into ingredients. And that, by using the 12 principles of green chemistry, is transformed into P2 science. It is now um, having bio-based ingredients, getting luxury from the products of the forest and the field, and this is in most of the formulated ingredients, the, the cleaners, the cosmetics, the personal care products that you slather on your body every day. This is what designing for uh, inherent health means. Now, this talk about transforming waste into products, of course, I hope that one of the greatest accomplishments that we ever have is going to be that we turn the greatest problem, CO2, into our greatest opportunity by turning it into things like building materials here, concrete uh, 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 here. We actually transformed CO2 into a luxury vodka that's carbon negative. And why do we do that? To address climate change? No. To capture people's imaginations. Because if you can imagine that you can turn it into a luxury vodka, CO2, you can imagine that you can turn it into anything. So the second time, another time that um, a student walked into my office was Dr. Stafford Sheehan. Staff Sheehan is the one that worked on our CO2 utilization, turning CO2 into all kinds of things. And yes, he is the chief technical officer and co-founder of the air company that I was launched and I'm proud to be a part of. And so is this science fiction, you know, this transformation of CO2 into products? Time to take off. To take off the limitations of how fuel is made. To take fossil fuels off the table. And take on the responsibility of sustainable innovation. It's time for a new take on takeoff. Introducing a jet fuel made from the very air we travel through. We're using carbon technology to take CO2 from the atmosphere and transform it into sustainable aviation fuel. Turning our planet's most abundant pollutant into a never ending resource. The path to a cleaner future is in the air. Time to take off. This is reality. When you put this fuel into a, a US Air Force jet and you see that rolling down the, the uh, runway to, for takeoff, that is a nerve wracking time. And I can tell you when you see it streaking through the sky, that is exhilarating. So the US Air Force, NASA, uh, Virgin Atlantic and JetBlue Airlines have off-take contracts and the, the largest plant is being built by Niagara Falls to take advantage of that renewable energy to make carbon neutral sustainable aviation fuels. Now, there's 30 years ago would be a reasonable question. Can we make our products and processes sustainable? The answer to that has been, it's been asked and answered. The answer is we can because we have. Now the question is, will we? Will we do it at scale? Will we do it with the urgency that's necessary in order to, to meet these? And to do that, it's going to take brilliant science and technology, but it's also going to take much more. The periodic table of the elements is something we all know, but there are many aspects, many elements that are going to be required. And those are going to go far beyond just science and technology. The metaphorical periodic table of these elements not only includes the science and technology, 
to get to these humanitarian go goals of sustainable food, water, shelter. But it's also going to need these enabling system conditions. Everything from economic investment, new research programs, new metrics, new ways of, uh, uh, of, of teaching, chemical uh, footprint, uh, new metrics, in order to meet these, these noble goals of zero waste and life compatible products and processes. This is what chemists and engineers do. This is what everybody should do because we're going to need all of these aspects to get where we want to go. I will say, I want to say thank you for, for your attention and as a small gift for the invitation, this has been turned into a book. If you want to click, you can get this book in a, a free ebook. And the reason that I'm the most optimistic person in just about any room that I'm in is because I fully believe this quote from Mahatma Gandhi, that the difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would more than suffice to solve most of the world's problems. It's been an honor. Thank you. Uh, you've sent my head spinning. I, I had a conversation during the week with a data scientist. You talk about data. And he's talking about a digital circular economy. So I'm thinking I'm, that fit. this works together somehow, but I don't know. And in terms of scale, you can, you can make as much of that luxury vodka as you like. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's do that. Um, come up, gentlemen, because I know there are going to be questions. I've got a couple, but I want to go to the audience first. And I know we'll have questions from online, which we'll have as well. Mm -hmm. Can I take a question from the audience first? Because I think we've heard a lot of stuff tonight, and it's going to be, uh, there'll be a no any number of questions here. So come, you come to the microphone. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you, sir. Um, this isn't a question, but um, you talked about hermit crabs. And uh, I just found this out today. But um, when a hermit crab finds a new larger shell they will inspect the shell and um see if it fits if it doesn't fit they will wait they will wait beside the shell for up to eight hours and wait for other hermit crabs to um come and inspect the shell then after a while they'll all line up smallest to largest mm -hmm. and try on that shell <laughs> mm -hmm. until um it fits one of them and then the person then the sh then the hermit crab that that shell fits passes down their shell and that keeps on happening. So it's not yeah. really related, kind of is, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, there are beautiful YouTube videos that mm. show that process. Yeah. It is, it's beautiful. Yeah. This one here, Scott. Thank you for just stunning presentation, just, just brilliant, thank you. Um, I suspect that perhaps a lot in the general community would see the chemical industry, big chemistry as the enemy or a problem, um, which I think you've shown is, is quite incorrect. But um, do you sort of see uh, a path to sort of get the community, the broader community to see big chemistry, chemical industry as, as, as a solution to the problem rather than being the problem of itself? Uh, yes, the, you know, there are horrible stories in the past and some of the vilification of some companies is well justified, but to broadly paint the entire science of chemistry is, <coughs> that, that's just not cool. Um, but yeah, companies have to pull their weight and, and recognize that there is a, a broader view to what the future really needs to be. Yeah, I, I just say it's, it's, not, um, it's not chemistry that's the problem. Stubbornness is the problem. Status quo is the problem. The clinging to our old ways of doing things is, is the problem. We need to be genuinely innovative, genuinely curious. Thomas Jefferson said, I should wear still the coat I wore as a young boy than to suffer under the, the, the current regime of yesterday. So we need to evolve. Some di dinosaurs will evolve, some will go extinct. <laughs> Uh, how, how specifically would you change the atmospheric carbon dioxide into uh, jet fuel or, or any hydrocarbon? Sure. Uh, so uh, there's a variety of, of ways that can capture it. Capture it at the smokestack is the best way rather than trying to, to suck it out of the atmosphere, which is a battle against entropy. Uh, 
So once you capture it, you then take, uh, ideally, hydrogen that you got from splitting water, especially seawater, into hydrogen and oxygen. You can then react the hydrogen with the CO2, and then you can generate uh, various types of fuels, as well as many other types of molecules. I, I first heard that uh, 15 years ago for a group in Israel, and they were starting to do that. And I don't really know those guys, but I'm delighted to hear that it's really moved forward. The Weizmann yeah, Institute, yeah. is that right? Yeah, yeah the yeah, Weizmann. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and again, that's a, a space where there's a lot to learn from nature because the, the best CO2 utilization device in the world is a tree. Yes. Proven technology. On that for tree, mm -hmm. um, we've spoke about this many times in the past. Mm -hmm. When you look at Australia and trees and mm -hmm. our propensity at the moment for fire, same in, the, in Europe, same mm -hmm. in... North America, we get by pretty well here because we grow so quickly because our, our growing seasons. A lot of these pro products you're showing us now are from trees or from linden. Mm -hmm. The mills use that linden for fuel. Mm -hmm. The mills are then talking about using um, rubbish, the household consumer waste to feed their mills, to mm -hmm. feed the energy of those mills. And we go around that circle. Do we lose a lot of the potential recycling sustainability because we're burning that? And around mm -hmm. the world, in, certainly in, in Europe, they're importing mm -hmm. rubbish into Sweden now to burn those, keep those fuels going. Mm -hmm. So you look at packaging per se and how we are on packaging and how we try and do packaging. Mm -hmm. And each time we get to a point, 2007, the global financial crisis died again. Just before COVID, everything was going. Just before the Ukraine war. All the materials that we're looking at, the unloved materials, the materials that you can get cheap or cheaper or they were thrown away and reused, suddenly became popular again. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden the prices went up and all the green chemistry went out of the window. All that information, all of that availability went out of the window mm -hmm. again. And it yeah. happens every 10 years. Yeah. You get to a point and all of a sudden you lose it. Yeah, it, it it's, it's an interesting point. I, um, hopefully though not too controversial here in my response is that, you know, we in chemistry tend to glorify the petroleum products. We say, look at the drugs that we've made in the textiles and the magic and, oh my God, it's so cost effective and inexpensive and all these other things. That we got to realize that for the last 80 years, the petroleum industry has been by far the most heavily subsidized through government uh, organizations on the planet. If you were to take any material and put in the trillions of dollars that have gone into the subsidies of the R&D of the petroleum industry, any other material would be doing exactly the same thing today. And so we make a mistake of thinking there's something magic about the material when it was actually there's something magic about why governments decided to subsidize since the 19, you know, to the early 1930s and 40s, give this massive R&D benefit. So the thing is, I look at that not as, you know, obviously we can complain and have a lot of sadness about it, but it's also optimism. That means with the will and with trying to focus on this, it's been done before, we could do it again, but this time with a more sustainable material. You know, and so that's, that's my first reaction. Uh, I guess the only thing I'd add is that when we're talking about these, these market forces, these economic frameworks that have allowed this unsustainable tra trajectory to happen, I'm not the first one to note that markets are a miraculous tool, a terrible master and an even worse religion. Markets and economic frameworks have no place in the sacred and the priceless, or the evil and the abhorrent. They're fine at trading goods and services, but we need to relegate these economic frameworks to their appropriate place and nowhere else. I'm going to go back and look at the video and write that down. <laughs> thank you. I'd very much like to thank you for the most enjoyable presentations. My, I would be very interested in a commentary that you have in terms of the rapidly advancing technology along what the lines you're talking and the, the potential risks associated with that. Um, I suppose in a sense where I'm coming from is lithium-ion battery technology and, for example, the influence on the structural stability of car parks, you know, something as random as that, right, that they're heavier cars. We, um, in, in an allied sort of uh, concept, yeah, they're fire loading, 
in terms of some of those. So we're advancing faster than regulators can respond, faster than in maybe even in our scientific um, history, maybe we be moving faster than we ever have before. And just some, some views on the, on the risk of that. Very important point, and, and again, I <laughs> the obvious, get a little bit of a bias here. This is, illustrates the importance of green chemistry you know, so profoundly. If I were to hold a vessel of some material in front of everybody, and I could take you know, 14-year-old children, CEOs of companies, PhD chemists, or any group of people say, let's describe this stuff. What is it? And someone's going to say solid, liquid, gas. Someone's going to say it boils at a certain temperature, freezes, it has a color, has a viscosity, has a conductivity. And we would rattle off all of these things and fill out a list of the description. But ironically, right now here in 2023, I would bet most groups would not talk about its toxicity, wouldn't talk about its impact on the environment. For some reason, we in chemistry and material science have given that to somebody else to think about. And so when we rush to do things, we want it to be a, a, a certain color, or we want it to be a certain whatever the chemical and materials properties. But if that design includes the toxicity and the impact on the environment, then as long as we have that as part of the consideration, by all means, go as fast as you can. But if we're getting that speed by leaving behind those considerations, then we're in trouble. And how can we ask a chemist who has never had a class in predictive toxicology or understanding the impacts on, human, on, on the environment to include something that we're monkeys typing Shakespeare, okay? We need to change the way we, our relationship with the field of chemistry. And then we can start doing as fast as we want as long as we consider everything that's important, not just the things that are conveniently important. If I could just add, there's a, there's a reason why my new book is called First Do No Harm. It's because at the heart of green chemistry is you have to have an understanding of the hazard and the hazard potential. We make decisions based on risk, risk analysis, risk assessment. Risk works perfectly well right up until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, the results are usually catastrophic. So instead of doing risk assessment, that's different from sustainable design where you understand the inherent nature and the inherent potential to cause harm. Scott, this question here. Following on from your hope, um, I'm a science and STEM secondary teacher for over 20 years. Um, I've been trying to make changes in e secondary education in Australia mm -hmm. to include green chemistry, but in a realistic way. Mm -hmm. um, the textbooks that are available that are in schools just brush over it. Mm -hmm. And organic chemistry, that's lovely, it's mm -hmm. fine. Um, I was very impressed by your and your wife's benign design. Um, I'm waiting for the videos to come out mm -hmm. so I can utilise those in my classroom, mm -hmm. so I can then connect them to um, quizzes, so I can actually get this across to the kids mm -hmm. in the classroom. The reason I'm here tonight is because um, I want this to happen before they hit the universities. Mm -hmm. I want STEM and mm -hmm. science to yeah. be realistic. Yes. So, <laughs> you can hear in my voice. Yeah, but... um, it's, it's a really big thing. And mm -hmm. when I teach the kids, and I'm in a 2000 secondary, children's mm -hmm. secondary school, um, and they love it. They mm -hmm. go crazy over green chemistry mm -hmm. when I teach it there. Mm -hmm. And I've got six teachers now who I've got on board. Mm -hmm. But how mm -hmm. do we get that connection to come up from mm -hmm. what I consider to be the grassroots, mm -hmm. because my biggest advocates are mm -hmm. not my wonderful kids who go to great universities like Monash mm -hmm. to teach STEM. They're the ones in my classrooms. Mm -hmm. And it's the year sevens who've mm -hmm. been taught science, basic science in, in a primary school who come through. Mm -hmm. And then I have the unique opportunity to be able to open their eyes to things like the toxicity in mm -hmm. cosmetic chemistry. Yep. Um, and we've got a discussion going on at the moment about mm -hmm. parabens. Yep. Why are parabens banned mm -hmm. in Europe mm -hmm. and we won't even discuss them in the media mm -hmm. in Australia? Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm at the point where I'm, I'm seriously thinking of doing um, active citizen science mm -hmm. with the kids mm -hmm. to try to get this out into the press because mm -hmm. it's their children's children's, you mm -hmm. know, that, that need to know this sort of thing. But mm -hmm. 
how do we as a society in Australia mm -hmm. actively say it's the kids in the secondary schools mm -hmm. that we need to actually get excited about mm -hmm. their future and their Absolutely. hope and no yeah. toxicity, mm -hmm. but also the possibilities of solving a lot of the problems. You, you have the most important job in the world. It's, this, it's secondary education, K through 12 education is critical. Statistics show that if a child isn't turned on and excited by science by 12 years old, they never will be. And we need to change this relationship between society and science and chemistry. Now there are a lot of networks. The American Chemical Society has a very active network on in creating this growing network of a, of a, of a living community. You know, just earlier this week up in Cairns, the Royal Australian Chemical Institute celebrated a, a, the be nascent beginning of a green chemistry division forming these international collaborations between what's going on in the UK and in the United States and the things happening in Australia. So that community is growing and that's becoming more accessible and beyond benign is, is right in the middle of all of that. So there is hope and there are things happening and, and we, we, when people talk about the pipeline, and we talk about materials pipeline and materials flow, we forget that the most important pipeline is human capital, is who is going to be working in the next universities and in the next factories. We need these skills to be developed and so it's just absolutely critical. There's just two things I wanna add. One, uh, one message is, this isn't 25 years ago, you're not alone. Yeah, exactly. Huge community. Um, the second thing, I have to quote the great John Warner, who said, maybe it's not about the way we make molecules. Or maybe it's not just about the way we make molecules. Maybe it's about the way we make chemists. Ah. <laughs> okay. So can I, ask you, can I ask you also, either talk to me or the man with the microphone, who's the editor of our... Science Victoria magazine that the society produces. Would you write me a letter to president at rsv.org about that dilemma? Because it's exactly the thing that the Royal Society of Victoria now needs to do is to promote those arguments and bring them forward. We're doing our level best now to move into that space where we become a, 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 a point where those problems can be vocalised. We need to take science out to the community to understand your dilemma in the classroom. It's really important. It's quite funny because my principal calls me <laughs> yeah. the kids in chemistry. Mm -hmm. We want Pied Pipers here <laughs> doing that. We want to be the vehicle to help you mm -hmm. deal with that issue. I've got a question for you, um, for you both. Uh, thank you both for a wonderful presentation. I guess the first question is, John, do you remember saying that? Um, what's well, been attributed to you just then? Um, <laughs> it's on YouTube. I can prove <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I got yeah, the yeah, video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> More importantly though, I think, um, are there lessons that you have picked up from your successes in the US in getting some of these things actually rolling that you think could, could work here in Australia? Um, as, as someone else has commented, you know, we're seeing successes in, in um, or, or even um, uh, regulations implemented in Europe that aren't taken on board here. So I'm wondering, things that you've been involved with in interacting with different levels of, of the government and the public service, with the people, with the companies in America that you think mm -hmm. might be applicable here in Australia? Well, it's, it's not just in the US, it's everywhere. And, and again, I, I, I get teary here, so I'm going to have to. I'm, I, there are so many amazing people everywhere in the world where something happens. It happens because one, two, or three people just decided to make it happen. And they say, this is wrong, what's happening, and we're going to make it right. And that force of people just getting together and growing, whether it's in one country or another country, everywhere it is, it's because a handful of people just say let's let's make this right and so this will happen and like i said i've just in the last week there are pockets all over the place of amazing happening here in australia it's just we need to find ways to nurture these 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 pockets to reinforce them and find ways to collaborate so that people aren't reinventing the wheels and it's all there it's 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 how can we we help pull it up yeah. and, and i'd just say very quickly that a lot of this is about the power of persuasion and communication. We need to speak the language of the tribe we're talking to. When we look at green chemistry, 
Is it good for the environment? Sure. Is it good for economic development? Sure. And increases innovation and profitability? Sure. Public health? Yes. But all of those messages aren't going to hit equally with various audiences. Moral and ethical imperative? Yes. Uh, so you need to focus on the things that your audience can hear um, and focus on those benefits. Uh, just wondering what book you would recommend that we ask our local library to get to promote these ideas. Um. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to do that here. Uh, Paul, 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 you've described, you, you actually described yourself, and you, 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 you've both worked in, uh, with, with political administrations. Mm -hmm. There seems to be, I mean, I mean, that's another nut we have to crack as well, right? We've got to, we've got to change some paradigms about uh, how our government, your government, uh, mm -hmm. responds to the sort of things you're talking about. Yeah. What's your experience as a public administrator or a public servant in that space? Yeah, uh, so one cannot underestimate the power of the status quo. Uh, the, the, to stop progress from happening, and, and there there are techniques to uh, to to make things happen, um, because it's usually that there are uh, there's uh, various threads. So if if you are getting stopped by people saying, oh, this is this is not able to be profitable, then you have to show actually these new companies. So one of the things that we did years ago, John mentioned. We established the Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award under President Clinton. And he did this in order to not just pat people on the head, but to show a model that, hey, these companies are making a lot of money off of doing green chemistry. So it takes the argument that, well, you can't make money doing green chemistry. What? You're making a lot of money doing green chemistry. We established science awards, so people say, oh, that, chem that green chemistry is soft, fuzzy, not really as rigorous. Hold it. These Nobel Prize winners, what, three of the last four Nobel Prizes, the, the committee has cited this as a benefit to green chemistry, and et cetera, et cetera. So you start picking out what it is that the status quo is using as its, uh, as its strategy, and you go after that. Nice. Another question here. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it on? That's right. Okay. So um, I'm 15, so I'm someone who's currently like being educated about different sciences, and so I was just wondering, as um, as infrastructure changes and science changes and the status quo changes, what do you think is the most important? part or aspect of green chemistry that we need to be educating others about or that we need to be implementing into chemistry or just into general science? I'll begin. Yes, yes. So the first thing is to understand that it can be done mm. and that it won't happen by hopes and dreams and wishes, but it's going to be happening because of people like you. And that to make a sustainable future, you can't sit on the sidelines and hope that it happens. It's to say, okay, I want to participate in this. And it's going to have to take a, a, a lot of collaboration, a lot of work, but to say, okay, how do I do this? You know, I, I, a lot of people, I, I, I'm always surprised when, when people come and say, I work for a company that, you know, I, I can't do green chemistry. Then don't work for them. All right, you have a choice of what you're going to do. And you're either going to bring about the future that you want or you're going to support the status quo. Don't underestimate that power alone, that if everybody just did the right thing, we will change the world. And so, but recognize that and make sure that the peers do and see that path to how to feed your family, do the things you need to do to exist in this life, but do it by doing the right things, not the wrong things. Yeah. The status quo isn't just going to change. You're going to change the status quo. <laughs> yeah. So the only way to be respected by the future is to be a heretic today. You can't go, nobody's going to, from the future, is going to look back on any of us and say, oh, they were so great, they supported the status quo. Yeah. No, we know that change is necessary and we have to be part of that change. There's a really famous saying by Isaac Newton. He said, if I can see the horizon, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. 
And everybody said, oh, isn't that wonderful? Isaac Newton was so magnanimous in thanking those that came before him. Implicit in that statement was that he was saying that the giants couldn't see the horizon. Right? So what does that mean? What that means is no matter how much you respect your teacher, your mentor, your professor, your boss, whoever it is, whoever's your idol, they can't see the horizon. You can. I'm going to take that as a perfect spot just mm -hmm. to wind up. These guys have done an enormous job. Mm -hmm. Don't go away. Uh, I, I was looking forward to tonight, uh, and I've immensely enjoyed it. It's gone way beyond. We've, you've made my head spin, as I said. Mm -hmm. I'm going to invite uh, Tony Paddy now to come up and uh, offer a vote of thanks. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Rob, and I think everyone will agree. We've heard a holistic and complementary message from both John and Paul tonight. John, who's given us the insights into sustainability through the um, pendulum of cycles around molecules, materials and products, learning from nature and how green chemistry really fits into all this and how we can achieve sustain true sustainability through green chemistry and the need for invention, how so much hasn't been invented, a challenge for all of us, particularly our, our younger people coming through today who will be the leaders in the future. And from Paul, um, the importance of looking at things in a new perspective. Um, warned us about the unintended consequences of things that we've been doing. Stating our problems clearly. Sometimes, as Paul said, the problem is incorrectly stated told us about efficiency, the limitations of our actions, and alerted us to the need to look at the value of the action, the need to do a better thing. Forces of transformation we heard about tonight. And importantly, the need for dynamic design, again, where green chemistry is going to help us achieve this. We really thank John and Paul for this book. It really started 25 years ago, and it's growing and growing and growing through an international movement. And I think that's fantastic. I'm really proud that Monash and other universities in Australia are, are picking up the gauntlet, particularly through our training centre. Um, I'd like to thank the Royal Society of Victoria for um, helping have this public lecture tonight. And uh, I hope everyone can join with me in thanking John for what you've heard tonight and Paul. Thank you so much. <laughs>